All right, let's go ahead and uh, get started here. Brother Henry, if you'd uh, open us in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we've assembled here now to study your holy and precious word, Lord. I pray that you'd be with us as we're here tonight, Lord, and open our minds, open our hearts, Lord. And I ask that you'd be with Brother Ray, Lord, you put in his mouth, Lord, what you'd have us to hear here, Lord, in this, in this uh, Bible study, Lord. And Lord, I ask now that you uh, write this in my heart, in our hearts, Lord, that we can retain it, Lord, or mind, Lord, that we can bring it back up, Lord, when the when occasion arrives, Lord. And we don't forget your holy, precious word, Lord. Love you, Lord. That's all this in your holy, precious name. Lord Jesus, amen. 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 All right, uh, this evening, if you'll uh, open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. How many of you are aware it is now officially allergy season? I have the barometer for that. I can... Yeah, yeah. Now I sound like I'm back home. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And uh, the idea is, is uh, in this lesson is, uh, now we've already looked at the trinity of man, the fact that you do have a body, a soul, and a spirit. What happens to your body? What happens to your soul? What happens to your spirit when you die? What happens to them according to the Word of God? So we're going to look at that. Uh, first of all, in Ecclesiastes, where does the body go? This one's real simple. All right. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Look with me in verse 20. All go unto one place. All are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Right? I uh, just had a funeral this week, and we buried someone. We put them in the ground. That's where you go. You know why? That's where you came from. Your body is dirt, and it's going to return to the dirt from whence it came. That's where the body goes. Now, a Jehovah Witness will take that verse right there and say, see, the body and the soul are the same, and so when you die, you just your soul just sleeps in the ground. That's what Jehovah Witnesses teach, because they use this verse right here. It says, all go into one place. Yeah, but it's talking about dust. It's talking about your physical body. It's not talking about your soul. Look what it says in verse 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward? Well, I thought all went to one place. Now, you see, they try to use that for the whole man. You can't do it. Where does the spirit go when you die? Well, the spirit of man goes upward, and the spirit of beast that goeth downward to the earth. There's a spirit in animals, and that spirit is earthly. And when it, when it leaves, it returns into the earth. Uh, a spirit of a man, when you die, your spirit returns to the Lord that gave it. That last breath that you take when you die, that's your spirit returning to the Lord. But your spirit is not you. You understand that. And we looked at that when we did the study on the Trinity of Man. Uh, your spirit has no personality uh, to it. Your spirit is just a, a, your life force, if it were. Your what the uh, Eastern religions call your your key. Uh, that's why your your Eastern martial arts experts and all that stuff. The reason they become so lethal and so good is it's not just the fact that they're fast and have good reflexes and all that. It's they know the spirit of man. They're in touch with that stuff. You decide you're going to throw him a right cross. He already knows you're going to throw him a right cross. He senses it in your spirit. See. So that's that, those kind of things there. Now, uh, when you talk about the soul, now you're talking about something that's eternal that will go someplace. And that's who you are, the ego, the I am, the self. The eternal soul of man goes to different places at different times in history. People in the Old Testament, when they died, did not go to heaven they couldn't have gone to heaven. The blood of Jesus Christ had not been shed. See? Uh, and so, different times, the soul of man goes to different places. We'll look at that. Look first in Genesis chapter 35. And these are verses that will blow a Jehovah Witness out of the water when they try to say that the body and the soul are the same. Look in Genesis chapter 35.
And in Genesis 35, uh, notice verse 16, And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. All right. When does her soul leave? When does it depart? The second she dies. Well, her body's still there, and they carry it on a little further, and, and she's buried there in Bethlehem. Okay? So, this idea of the soul and the body being the same is nonsense. But what happened when she died was her soul departed. Uh, as people say, the, the departed loved ones. You're departed. They've departed. They've left. Yes, they have. Well, where did they go? See, that's the question. Look in Genesis chapter uh, 50, or 49. Last verse in 49, and then we'll look in chapter 50 as well. And this is uh, the death of Jacob, Israel. In Genesis 49 and verse 33. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. He yielded up the ghost. Where does the spirit go? Okay, it goes upward, right? Yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. Well, that's not his body. That's his soul. How do you know it's not his body? Well, look at chapter 50, and what you find is they're going to do a long mourning for him. Uh, uh, days and days of mourning. Look at verse 3. And forty days were fulfilled for him, so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him threescore and ten days. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake in the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. There shalt thou bury me. After seventy days, they haven't even buried him yet. See? So it wasn't his body being gathered anywhere. It was his soul. And when you die, your soul leaves your body and your soul is eternal and it will spend somewhere forever. Look in Luke chapter 16. And here's what the Lord says happens before Calvary. Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and you, this is the rich man and Lazarus. And uh, look what happens, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels. Are they carrying his body? No. They're carrying his soul. You know why? Because your soul has weight. Otherwise, why would they carry it? See? Your soul has weight. It's energy. And if something has weight, and there's nothing in it to make it go up, like a plane. Have you ever seen a plane go up in the air? How does it do that if it has weight? It has propulsion. See? How does a balloon end up going up in the air? Yeah. It's got, it's got air in it. It's got spirit in it. But without that... Now, I'm going to let go of this. Ready? How many of you think you know what's going to happen to it when I let go of it? Raise your hand. How many want to bet me? That's right, because it ain't gambling. It ain't gambling. It's 100% guaranteed. It'll happen every time. Unless there's something to carry it. See? The reason it has to be carried is because it has weight. This isn't very heavy. It doesn't matter how heavy it is. If it has any weight at all, where's it going to go when it leaves your body? And just like that, the soul goes down either to hell 
or it goes up to heaven, or it's carried somewhere else. And in this case, when the beggar dies, he is carried by the angels according to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Wherever that is. The rich man also died and was buried. Well, there's his body, right? And in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments. I don't think that's the grave. Uh uh. Where'd he go? He went to hell. Well, yeah. Well, exactly. Either he's still alive in the coffin wondering what's going on. See? Right. Uh, and, and obviously, by, by reading this, there's no doubt about it. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. There's Abraham's bosom. He's in hell. He sees Abraham's bosom. And he sees Lazarus. How can he see him? He's got eyes. The soul has eyes. Now, you see that thing? You can see. Your soul can see. He sees. Notice. He sees. He sees the beggar. Verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, he can talk. Have mercy on me. And send Lazarus. He can identify Lazarus. And he's self-aware of who he is. See? In hell. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. He's got fingers. See? Your soul is just like your body. It's the same shape as your body. You ever hear these amputees that miss a leg or an arm or something and then they say, well, my fingers itch. And they don't even have an arm there, but their fingers still itch. Say, what is that? Well, there's still part of you that's there. See? Uh, Verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. He's got a tongue. In hell. He's got a tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. You can feel pain. The soul can feel pain. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you, between wherever hell is and wherever Abraham's bosom is, there is a great gulf fixed. Okay. There's something there between where hell is and where Abraham's bosom is. There's a great gulf thick so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Once you go to hell, it's too late. That's what the Lord just said. That's what He just taught. See? Now, when your soul left your body in the Old Testament... Either God sent angels to carry your soul to Abraham's bosom or another, basically what's called paradise. We'll look at that in a minute. Or angels didn't come. In which case, your soul just naturally went where the law of gravity would take it to the pit, to the center of the earth, to hellfire. Look over in Luke chapter 23. The story of the two thieves on the cross. Neither of them gets baptized. Neither of them joins the church. Neither of them says the rosary. Neither of them goes to confession. One goes to paradise and one goes to hell. See, what's the difference? One called upon Jesus Christ and one didn't. Real simple. Look in uh, Luke chapter 23 and verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, 
seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. So what's he saying? Hey, why don't you get off his back and leave him alone? We're getting what we deserve. We had it coming. He ain't done nothing wrong. Why don't you get off his back? What's he saying? He's sticking up for him, see? In verse 42, And he said unto Jesus, Now watch this. He said unto Jesus, What did he say? Well, only you have a King James Bible. Only if you have a King James Bible. See? You got another version of the Bible? He said unto him, Jesus, remember me. That's what the new Bible say. No, it's whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Well, the Lord didn't ascend up into heaven for three days. But he told that guy right there, when I die, I'm going to paradise and you're going with me. Today, thou shalt be with me. Where? In paradise. So Abraham's bosom most likely was specifically for the Jew and there was probably different areas within that for the different nations. The whole thing altogether was known as paradise. All right? You had paradise and you had hell. And they were both down in the earth and there was a gulf fixed between the two. So when someone died in the Old Testament, they were either, their soul was either carried by the angels to paradise or their soul was just left out of their body without God there to help them and their soul went to hell. One or the other. According to the Bible. That's where the soul went when it left the body. Uh, one more real quick. Look in 1 Samuel 28. And here we're, is uh, Saul. He's about at the end of himself. He's gone crazy. Paranoid, schizophrenic. Uh, how to kill David at all costs. And uh, he's praying and God's not answering him and God isn't going to have anything to do with him. So he finds a, uh, a woman with a familiar spirit and he's going to go to her and have her call up Samuel so he can ask Samuel what he should do. Now here in 1 Samuel chapter 28, we'll begin in verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that, may I go, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Uh, I thought Saul had made a rule that all the familiar, people with familiar spirits were supposed to be killed. Notice how much his, his own servants obeyed him. They know there's a woman right down the road that's doing it. They don't take anything he says seriously. They know Saul pretty well. The servant said unto him, Behold, there's a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me up whom shall I name unto thee. So they're having a seance. You know, they're calling on one of their lost relatives to come up and talk to him, that kind of stuff. That's what's going on here. Verse 9, And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done. Now she's talking to Saul, but he has disguised himself. She doesn't know it's him. Thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and, and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord... Well, he's so religious. He loves the Lord. I swear to God. A lot of people swear to God, but they don't, <laughs> they don't obey God. Now, that's what's going on here. Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. <laughs> He's really coming up. <laughs> this isn't a gimmick this time. This isn't just some familiar spirit which is just a spirit that's familiar with who you are, so it can act like you, see? Uh, this is really Samuel that's coming up. And she realizes right away when this happens, this must be the king, because he's got power when I ask this thing that God would obey it. See? And uh, so right away she knows the gig is up. She knows this is Saul. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, what Saul is thou? 
And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. That's a different study. And he said unto her, What form is he of? She said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Where did he come from? Where did Samuel come from? He just called him up from the earth. See? He came up out of the earth to come now and speak with Saul. And it's actually Samuel that's doing it. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? I don't think he was in hell. Samuel was a prophet of God. He was a good man. He went to paradise. What does he say when, when uh, Saul brings him up? Man, what do you bother me for? I was having a good time in paradise. And you're bringing me up to talk with you. See that? See that thing? That's how you deal with these kooky charismatics that talk about they, they know some preacher somewhere that's raising people from the dead. Nonsense. Nonsense. Were, were they in heaven or were they in hell? Were they lost or saved? Well, if they were lost and you raised them from the dead, that means they got a second chance. God gave them a second chance uh, he ain't giving nobody else, but he's going to give them. And if they were saved, why would they want you to resurrect them in the first place? They're with Jesus in heaven, man. From the second that Paul ended up getting stoned in Lystra and went up to heaven and saw things and heard things that's not uh, lawful for a man to utter, from that time forward, Saul was saying, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He was worthless, but God used him. <laughs> but as far as his heart and his mind, he was, he was ready to go to heaven. He was ready, and finally when that day came, he said, my departure is at hand. Praise the Lord, I'm ready to go. See, why? He had seen it. He had seen it. He knew exactly what he's talking about. Uh, that's our apostle who we follow, the one that really went to heaven. Amen. Uh, and so this, this whole thing here is proof again that um, there are souls, and in the Old Testament, they went where? They went down into the earth. When, Sam, uh, when Samuel's raised up, he says, Why hast thou disquieted me? So obviously he's in a good place. What do you say? So uh, Samuel is there in paradise and uh, called up by Saul. Now, um, where did Jesus go when he died? Let's look at that. Well, first of all, where did his body go? Look in Luke chapter 23. Because everything changes from this point on. Luke chapter 23 and verse 50. Luke chapter 23 and look in verse 50. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also had waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. All right, so we see where his body goes. It's placed in the tomb. Uh, where does it? Where does his spirit go? Yeah, look at verse forty-six. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, "Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit." And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. That's why they say, "Give up the ghost." See, that's the spirit that that goes back up to heaven. But where did Jesus go? Where did his soul go? See. Uh, that's looking verse uh, 43 of chapter 23. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So we know when Jesus died, that day his soul went down to paradise. And then he went to hell. Look in Acts chapter 2.
beginning in verse 27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. All right. What Peter is doing here is he's quoting David and what David had said. Look in verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, son of David, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. Well, his soul went to hell then. Otherwise, why would he say your soul wasn't left there? if it hadn't gone there. So Jesus' soul went to hell. Uh, look in Psalm 16. In the Psalms, chapter 16. Beginning in verse 9. Psalms 16 and verse 9. Therefore, my heart is glad, my glory rejoiceth, my flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Well, who's the Holy One? Yeah, obviously, it's, it's a, a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Peter had said. Thou wilt show me the path of life, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So where did Jesus sit down when he went back up to heaven? He sat down on the right hand of God. Pleasures forevermore. The Lord's saying that stuff and thinking that stuff while he's on the cross, knowing what he's going to have to go through. He's quoting all these things from the Bible to, to get through. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 12. And then we'll look back in the book of Jonah. So find uh, Matthew chapter 12, and then you can find Jonah chapter 1. Uh, starting in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. Matthew 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, If you speak in tongues, and no. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Then why would people be seeking after them? An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Reference, Jonah. Uh, Jesus says, you want a sign? I'll give you one. After three days in the heart of the earth, I'm coming back up just like Jonah did. Yeah. Look in Jonah. Chapter 1. Verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. You say, what? It was a whale, right? Well, what kind of a man, a whale, could swallow a man and then spit him out three days later on the shore? Well, I don't know, but I know the Bible says the Lord had prepared a great fish. See? This is a specific, individual, one-time-only thing that God prepares this whale for this purpose, and it's to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, right? 
so the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, why, is, why does he say Jonah? If Jonah's in a fish and he's in the heart of the earth. The heart of the earth? Not buried in the earth. The heart of the earth. See? Down in the center of the earth. Down in hell. Look in verse 1 of chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed. When? When did Jonah pray? Now read verse 17 again of chapter 1. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed. Now, this prayer of Jonah's that you're reading in chapter 2 is after three days and three nights. You with me? In other words, people miss that because they're going from chapter 1 to chapter 2 and they, they, they all of a sudden they, they forget what they're doing here. If you just keep reading that thing down through there, it makes perfect sense. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights then. See? So after three days and three nights of Jonah being in the belly of the fish, well, how could a man live for three days in a fish's belly and then come back? Well, he didn't live. Yeah, that's what You get these skeptics out there saying, well, I know the Bible isn't true. After all, how could a man be alive for three days? The Bible doesn't say he was alive. The Bible just said that after three days and three nights, he prayed. Look at verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried, past tense. He's talking about three days earlier. I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. See, this prayer is Jonah recollecting Previously, when he was talking to God, when he was in hell. Follow along, verse 3. For thou hast cast me into the deep. Alright? What did they do? The men of the boat, they took Jonah and they threw him off into the water so that the storm would stop. Right? And then the uh, whale comes and is going to swallow up Jonah. Thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. And the floods compassed me about. He's drowning. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, dying, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. I'm going to heaven. Wrong. See, Jonah would have, except Jonah didn't obey the Lord. Jonah was running from God. And if God had wanted to, he could have just let Jonah stay in hell and been perfectly justified. The waters compass me about even to the soul. See? The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the mountains. No. To the bottoms of the mountains. That's pretty low. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars. There's hell. It was about me forever. The gates of hell. Okay? They're literal gates. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. He's, this is three days later. Now he's praying and he's thanking God for bringing him out. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. What's he doing? He's in hell saying, God, please, let me out. I'll go. I'll preach. I'll do what you want. See? You ever been there where you were making promises to God? Uh, he's making promises to God. But I will sacrifice unto thee the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto, the, uh, and preach unto it the preaching that I shall bid thee. 
And so Jonah goes in and what does he do? What's his message? Forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. <laughs> That's it. No repent, no get right, no nothing. Just going in there saying, and the whole town was converted and got right with God. Why? I guess if you ever went to hell and God did let you out, you'd be able to preach. Yeah, you'd be able to preach with real conviction. Amen. And, and that's, that's exactly what happens here. Uh, that's the only man besides Jesus Christ that ever went to hell and got out. Why? To be a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. To be that type. See? And so he's a, he's a representative. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Himself tells us that. And He went to hell and got out. And Jesus Christ went to hell and got out. And what did He do after He got out? He preached. What did Jesus do after He got out? Uh, any, any of you not going to hell anymore? Any of you gotten out of hell? Then what all you be doing? Amen. First uh, Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. You know the problem is a lot of people they don't really believe it. That's all. That's all it's about, really. I mean, if you really believe that you were saved from burning for all eternity, it would have an effect on you. <laughs> I really think it would somehow change you. That's the problem. People just don't really believe it. Uh, if you really believe that you were going to burn for all eternity, and now you're not, only because of God's grace, it, it, would, it would have a profound impact. Isn't that that's pretty good vernacular for a common, everyday... Uh, that's how they talk today, right? A profound impact on your vocation. Yes. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Thank God. He only had to do it once. The just, who's that? Jesus Christ. For the unjust, who's that? Us. <laughs> that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also He went and preached unto the spirits in prison. You know what he's doing in hell? He's preaching to the souls in hell. See? And then he's preaching to the souls in paradise. He goes over there to hell and he preaches at them and he lets them know, I was the one and you could have been delivered and I could have raised you up, but you forsake me and you didn't do my way and now you're damned and I've got the keys of hell and of death and bam, I shut the door and you're stuck. Then he goes over on to the other side. He goes over to paradise. Look at Matthew chapter 16. A very widely misunderstood passage. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, talking about Jesus Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The it is the rock. The gates of hell did not prevail against the rock, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. See? Uh, look over there in Revelation chapter 1. The last book in your Bible, the book of Revelation in chapter 1. Here's John before Jesus Christ in Revelation 1 and verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. You got that right. I saw a vision of the Lord. And, no, man. If you ever did actually see Jesus Christ, you know what you'd do? You'd be on your face. Amen. 
Uh, when he saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. Whew, man, can you imagine? This thing really happened, folks. Can you imagine that was you? <laughs> the Lord was right there doing that. Man, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. He got out. The gates of hell could not prevail against him. Why? He had the key. <laughs> he had the key. And so he got out. Amen. And when he got out, he, he took a stroll on over to the other side. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. For all those souls that have been in paradise for the last 4,000 years. And Jesus goes on over there and says, Boys, I'll tell you what. Now that the blood has been shed, now that the price for sins has been paid, now your sins can actually be taken away. I'll tell you what, now you can go up and be with me in heaven. Let's take this whole paradise thing here and let's move it. And that's what he did. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He led captivity. Well, they're captive, right? They're down in paradise. And the Lord says, let's go. We're getting out of here. And he, when he ascends on high, he brings them, those that are in captivity, with him up to heaven. I uh, say, how do you know that? Well, uh, look over there in Second uh, Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. In verse 2. Second Corinthians 12, 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. In other words, if you did go up to heaven with just your soul, you wouldn't even be able to tell if you were in your body or not. The soul and the body are that much alike. See, Verse 3, And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise. Why well, I thought paradise was down in the earth. You see, after Calvary, paradise has now been relocated. The Lord Jesus Christ led captivity captive. He moved paradise up into the third heaven. You say, how do you know it's the third heaven? Look in verse 4. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. All right, now look back in verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, such an one caught up to where? What is it? It's paradise. Paradise isn't in the earth anymore. Paradise is now up in heaven. Why? Because the redemptive price for sins has been paid on Calvary's cross. Look in Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time uh, past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. After he purged our sins, he went up to heaven and sat down on the right hand of God. And so our, if, if our sins are then purged, we could go up there with him. Uh, look over there in uh, chapter 10 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10. By the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Now you see that? Look back up there in verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. There's no animal sacrifice that could ever be offered that could take your sins away. See, people get a misunderstanding and they say, well, my sins were forgiven. Your sins could be forgiven. That doesn't mean your sins were taken away. They were still on your soul. And until the Lord's blood was shed, they couldn't be washed off. There was only one thing that could wash sin off of your soul, and it was the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. And until your sin, your soul could be washed in the blood from all sin, there's no way it could ever go up into heaven. Do you understand that? So that's why Jesus had to do what He did so that we could one day again be in the presence of God. Verse 11, And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. He's the offering. He's the only offering that can take away sins. And that's why all the souls in the Old Testament went to paradise in the earth. None of them can go up to heaven because there had never been a sacrifice able to take away uh, sin from your soul until the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself when God's blood was shed and He purchased us with His own blood. You all got that? We're okay? You all getting bored? I'm just making sure. Okay. Uh, All right, the, the annual, what you're talking about is the once a year sacrifice that Aaron did. Okay? That was a general sacrifice for the nation. Okay? That's for the nation. Individuals had to make their own sacrifices. You read that all the way through the book of Leviticus. If you sinned, you had to bring your own sacrifice for your sin. See? And you had to offer that, that's, uh, that sacrifice whatever was acceptable to God. And a lot of times it was based on what you could afford. You know, A poor person could bring a pigeon or a dove and a rich person had to bring a bullock or a goat or a sheep. You know, Depending on the different uh, sin sacrifice. That was a national thing. That was Aaron for the sins of the people in general, for the whole nation. right? But every individual had to offer their own sacrifices for sins. See? Uh, that's, that was the whole... Like I said, that's the thing. That's why you know... Uh, Muhammad was a joke. That's why you know Islam's a lie. Because Muhammad never mentions one time anywhere if he's supposed to be a prophet of God, why didn't he at least one time somewhere make an animal sacrifice for sins? Because every, every one of God's men in the Old Testament did. You know why? Because he knew that Jesus Christ paid the price for sins. He just didn't want to tell people about it because he was a liar and he was a fornicator. He just wanted to have a lot of wives and live his life the way he wanted to. Demon possessed. Amen. <laughs> All right. Uh, was there a question, Chuck? Yeah, I'm way behind. So I'm uh, probably been told already. Y'all. Uh, uh, what do you think of the idea of heaven? Like, you know, when we die, we go to paradise now. Yeah, we sure do. But paradise is in heaven. Yeah. Well, it's in the third heaven. It's the third heaven, right? There's three heavens. Yeah. There's, three, there's one heaven. They're all found in Genesis chapter one when God's doing His creation. There's one heaven where the birds fly, you know, where the planes go, where the clouds are. That's the first heaven, okay? The second heaven is the universe, okay? The final front, no. Um, and then beyond heaven, there's a giant wall of water, the great deep, and on the other side of that, there's nothing but light. See, God divided the light from the darkness. The universe, the second heaven, is in darkness. The third heaven is all in light. That's where God dwells, all right? That's where... Every Christian right now that's, that's uh, gone on to be with the Lord, that's where they're at right now. Okay. Right. In the third heaven. See, there's three heavens. Where are they at now? What heaven? The third heaven. They're with God in the third heaven. Right? There it is. There's your gulf again. See? Yeah. And it says that uh, the saints are up there on a sea of glass. Frozen water. 
one would think the face of the deep to be frozen. It sure is. See? Why? Well, you got absolute zero temperature. There's no, you know. <laughs> so maybe there's ice hockey in heaven. I don't know. What? God determined, but what determined who went to hell and who went to paradise? God. Yeah. God, God determined it. Now, what exactly you had to do, it's just not real specific. Uh, back then, it would just be... The, the main thing I can see all the way through the Bible is fearing God. See? Fearing God. Yeah. yeah. Well, just fearing God, because the only ones that had the law were the Jews. But everybody was supposed to fear God. Yeah, absolutely. Some did. Didn't they? What happened when Joseph showed up? Some of them feared God, didn't they? See? Same thing in Babylon. Same thing with the the Chaldeans. uh, Same thing in Persia. You see that all the way through the Bible where the Gentiles, uh, when a Jew showed up and started doing things, they realized, yeah, I fear God. I'm um, going to do right. Look at Darius with Daniel in uh, the lion's den. He didn't want to see that happen to Daniel. He feared God. There's non- that's nonsense. Okay. Uh, that's nonsense. There's no, nothing about that in the Bible. All that meant was that they were God's people, but all those promises were physical. The Jews didn't have any spiritual promises in the Old, Old Testament. They're physical promises. When you were a Jew and you did right, you could live a long life, you'd have good health, you'd have a big family, you'd have lots of money, you were blessed physically. It was all physical inheritance, you see. That's why that's... If you do right, you can get some of those things from those some of those physical things. But the the spiritual inheritance is what they were blind to. See, that's what Jesus was trying to get him to see the whole time he was there. Seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. They kept getting the cart before the horse, as it were. Yeah. Any other uh, questions, real quick? And we'll take a break and have some. Food, have some fellowship, and we'll pick it back up. All right. Uh, Wes, you want to ask the Lord to bless the food, please? Dear Father, Lord God, we just come to you tonight, Lord, thanking you, Lord, for, for Calvary, Lord, and moving paradise, Lord, and giving us an opportunity to uh, call upon your name, Lord, and believe in the Lord. And uh, we just thank you and love you, Lord. That you be the food and the fellowship, Lord. And uh, just thank you for Friday night, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus name. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Isn't it good to be saved? Amen.